we thank you that there is something special about uh, the manifestation of your presence when your saints are gathered together um, to sit under your word and to give you glory. Just, just such beauty in that. I would ask that, uh, not that you would fill us with your presence because you already have, but that we'd be aware of it this morning, that we would eliminate the distractions that might keep us from being aware of your awesome presence in our lives. Uh, Lord, I would ask that you would have mercy in the congregation as I attempt to teach to them this morning. Um, have grace on me. Uh, may your words be loud and mine be soft. Uh, may these words encourage us this morning. I'm looking forward to a, a sweet morning of encouragement. Um, Father, uh, we need refreshment. We need a break from the shame. And this morning, your text is all about that. Um, let the gravity of that, the joy of that, the excitement of that fill our hearts this morning. May people walk out remembering that you are the God that um, welcomes us to participate in the honor that is due you. Um, what a wonderful thing that we get to have. So I thank you so much for the, the people that are here, for those who are gathered at home watching. Um, may those individuals truly feel included in this body of, uh, of believers. Let them know that they are still part of the church uh, that they are longed for, that they are missed. And uh, Father, help them know that we are excited to have each and every one of them back. Uh, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, guys, hey, good morning. I'm Pastor Kevin, and we are in our series on First Peter. And we have been extensively looking at verses 4 through 8 in chapter 2 of First Peter. So if you have your Bibles, your apps, I'm going to go ahead and ask you right now. Go ahead and open them up at home. Please go ahead and do the same thing. Pull your Bibles open. It's good to have it in front of you. Um, Follow along with us, and it's a great place to reference. By now, we are in our fifth week studying the same four verses. Fifth week, same four verses. Uh, if you have not memorized this by now, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, like, I don't even know what I put on the screen. We're, we still have one more week. But what we've been doing is we've been going through uh, these four verses, verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, five verses, uh, is we're looking at what Peter is laying out as blessings for the believer, okay? Uh, this was going to be just a one-week thing. I looked at all six. I'm like, dude, easy sermon. Ten minutes each one of these blessings. But the problem was I was like, man, these are so good. I don't know why we need to rush through it. My goal isn't to try to get through a book. It's to teach you the full counsel of God's word. And each one of these blessings, my friends, uh, they have been encouraging to me. Uh, these, are, these are kind of evergreen sermons, I believe. These are ones you can go back to and watch over and over again because the truth that they reveal for suffering believers is just so sweet. And I hope that you're getting that from this. This week, we're going to be looking at our fifth blessing the believer has. So if you have your Bibles or apps by now, you should be in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's go ahead and I will read. I'd like to invite you to stand. And if you're at home, please stand as well. And I'm going to read you God's word this morning. So here's what Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. All right, guys, have a seat. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Charles Spurgeon. I love this guy. Great guy. I think you're, uh, it's kind of like the, he's like a Christian rock star. Uh, Spurgeon was a phenomenal man. Uh, uh, he's called the Prince of Preachers. Um, all of his sermons are gold. And he first started preaching at the age of 16. So uh, if you were looking at your 16-year-old, um, hold him to high standards because uh, God is very capable of using even uh, a 16-year-old to speak his word in powerful ways. Uh, but Spurgeon had a gift, and he started seeing that gift at about age 16. And he gave his first sermon. Um, to a very, very small handful of people at a cottage. And it was actually on this particular text that we're looking at this morning. It was verse 7. Now, we're going to be looking at verse 6 and 7, but he focused on verse 7, which is the bulk of our message this morning. And that was actually his first sermon he ever preached in his life. Now, fast forward a few decades, and he's in the prime of his life. He's no longer got a small handful of people at a cottage that he's teaching, but he has a massive 
audience. People travel half a day to come listen to the Prince of Preachers speak the word of God. Gold comes out of his tongue, they say. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal messages. And uh, he was feeling quite ill one Sunday. And he stood up, and if you read the, the, the transcript of it, and you can actually go on to a site called SpurgeonGems.com, and you can read all of his messages, and you can even hear audio of them of people trying to uh, mimic his voice, which is quite fun. Uh, but he felt quite ill, and he stood up in front of the congregation and says, I shouldn't be here this morning. I am feeling downtrodden, depressed. I am struggling. I am ill. I am not well. And uh, he basically said, I don't have anything prepared. I didn't know what I was going to do when I entered the pulpit. He goes, so what he did was he remembered that uh, a certain text that he always felt he could preach. And that was that very first text that he preached for his very first sermon. And I want to read you this quote of what he said. So he stood up in front of the congregation. He goes, this text, the one that we're looking at this morning, it calls to my recollection the opening of my ministry. As a lad of 16, I stood up for the first time in my life to preach the gospel in a cottage to a handful of poor people who had come together for worship. I felt my own inability to preach, but I ventured to take this text. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. I do not think I could have said anything upon any other text at that moment. Christ was precious to my soul. I was in the flush of my youthful love, and I could not be silent when such a precious Jesus was the subject. And that's how he began his sermon. And the punchline of his message that morning, as he taught on the text that we'll be looking at, was this. He said, is Jesus precious to your soul? Remember, on your answer to this question depends your condition. You believe if he is precious to you. But if he is not precious, then you are not believers. And you are condemned already because you believe not the Son of God. A very powerful challenge, very powerful sermon. I've read it. It's beautiful. Um, I would encourage you to look at it. And there's truth to it. The truth that the Christian should find Christ precious. And if the Christian does not understand or find Christ to be precious, that individual should question their own salvation. And ask themselves, are you truly in Christ? Uh, John Piper, who is basically the, the smaller, skinnier, malnourished Charles Spurgeon of our generation, um, preached the same text. And I think he's very similar to Spurgeon in the sense that they both very much delight in the Lord. And that comes through in their teaching. Um, Piper has made a whole ministry based off of delighting in God, desiring God, and finding complete satisfaction in his presence. Very much as Spurgeon did. But he preached this very same sermon uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, and he did it in a similar fashion. I want to read you a quote from a sermon that he preached in 1982 on this particular text that we're looking at this morning. He said, to you who believe he is precious, as he quoted the text, and then Piper went on to say, notice what happens when we connect verses 4 and 7. In verse 4, Christ is chosen and precious in the sight of God, and then in verse 7, he is therefore precious to us who believe. Piper goes on to say, believers are chips off the old block, as it were. We choose what our Father chooses. We feel to be precious what our Father feels to be precious. So both of these phenomenal, faithful men, let me say that again, faithful, faithful, phenomenal men that are treasures uh, in the Christian faith that we will continue to read for generations upon generations. These are wonderful men. They both focus on the idea that Christ must be precious to the Christian. And by conclusion, they said, if Christ is not precious to the Christian, you might not be a Christian. That was kind of where they came to. Again, I can't express enough how, how powerful and how emotionally compelling a message like that is. But I will say this, they were both right, but they were both wrong. It's a very hard thing for an uneducated guy who has defiled his face to sit up and say, I'm calling out these guys as wrong. I'm saying they were right, but they were wrong. And here's what they were right with. The right is... What they said is truth. The preciousness of Christ for the believer. The longing in the believer's soul to desire Christ above everything else. It is truthful. And that preaches every Sunday. But what they were wrong in is that's not what this text is teaching at all, my friends. That's actually not the heart of what Peter is teaching in verse 7. And the problem is, if you go online and you look up... Uh, this text, and you try to listen to sermons, 99% of them are all on the preciousness of Christ and how the believer should find Christ precious. Again, the problem is, as much as that is a rightful and true statement, and there's nothing wrong with preaching on it, that is not what our text is talking about this morning, okay? So here's what's going to happen. This morning, we're going to look at verse 6 through the beginning of verse 7. 
And in this, we're going to see Peter lay out that fifth blessing the Christian has in Christ, which prior to really digging into this this week, I would have said that the blessing is eyes to see the preciousness of Christ, just like our dear C.H. Spurgeon preached on, just like um, Pastor John Piper preached on. That is what I believed to be this fifth blessing based on the text. But as I dug deeper into it and poured over the Greek and the older commentaries, I've come to see more accurately that the fifth blessing that we find in this particular section of text is actually the ability to partake in honor. Now, as we look at this fifth blessing this morning, um, we will focus on the honor that Christ receives as the chosen cornerstone. We're going to focus on the honor that Jesus receives as the precious cornerstone, but we're also going to focus on the blessing the believer has in Christ, that's important, to partake in that very same honor. Are you tracking? We're going to look at the honor that Christ receives because of his position, all the things that he gets, and then we're going to look at our ability to partake in that very same honor through him. All right? Um, my hope for you guys this morning is going to be twofold. First, I do hope um, that you are challenged after this morning to examine God's word for yourself and not simply go with what seems to be the easy interpretation of text, okay? Um, I hope that you're challenged in how you study God's word. I hope that you're challenged to put more time into biblical interpretation or proper hermeneutics, um, proper exposition, proper exegesis, uh, and not for the ability to beat your chest saying, look how smart I am and how dumb other people are, but because you treasure God's word and you delight in knowing exactly what it is that he wants to say to you. That's the proper reason for getting into deeper theological studies, amen? Not for self-edification, but for God glorification. My second hope this morning is that you uh, do walk away very much encouraged this morning. I hope that you walk away overjoyed, knowing that the day is going to come uh, when the overwhelming majority of creation is going to stand before the creator, the overwhelming majority, and in one heartbreaking moment, this massive collective group of people throughout history, they're all going to partake in a collective shame and condemnation for the rejection of Jesus. But for those of you who are hidden in Christ, in that moment, you will be collectively honored for your belief and your acceptance of him as the one true chosen and precious cornerstone. I hope that you get that this morning and that encourages you deeply in your moments of suffering. Um, so if you guys are good with where we're going, if you kind of see what we're going to do, I, I'm sure you're wondering, Pastor Kevin, how do you plan to make this work, considering I have heard this preached before, I put more value in what Piper and Spurgeon says than you, I would agree, um, but I think we're going to do this well, and I think that we're going to do this biblically. And once again, I want to make it very clear that I delight in the ministry of both of these men. I sit underneath it through books and conferences, and by no means is this saying that there is something wrong with their teaching. Please understand this. I just think that oftentimes we can get caught up in emotionalism when we read the text and we can preach on things that are passionate to us and we miss what the Bible is truly trying to teach us, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. So let's look at this fifth blessing, which is the ability to partake in honor. All right. So that's what we're going to look at this morning, the fifth blessing the Christian has. Let's go ahead and read where this comes from. Again, I'm going to be looking at verse six through the beginning of verse seven. I'm going to call it like 7a, all right? And it reads like this. For in scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion. Let me preface this by saying this is Peter writing, but he is right now quoting the book of Isaiah chapter 28, where God is speaking. So right here, Peter writes, for in scripture, it says, then he steps back from his pen and he quotes Isaiah. And this is God speaking through the prophet of Isaiah. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before. And God says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now Peter goes back to partaking in his, in, picking up his pen, and he writes, Now to you who believe this stone is precious. That's our text. That's where we get this. To you who believe the stone is precious. And I'm somehow saying that it has something to do with partaking in honor. Um, so let's break down the text so we can kind of see what's happening here. We see a couple things happening. First, um, and I kind of jumped ahead with that slide, so just pretend that you don't see that. Just imagine it's invisible. Don't look at that bottom line, all right? That's, that's a mistake, all right? Don't look at that yet. You're not supposed to see it yet. It's a lot of slides. I do it all myself, all right? Um, here's kind of what we see happening. 
the first thing we see happen in this text is we see the father stating two facts about the son. Okay, this is the first thing. Look at that text. You see the father stating two facts about the son. You see that at the end of verse 6. What does he say? He says, a chosen and precious cornerstone. So he is identifying Christ as two things, right? Chosen and precious. Two facts about Jesus. The father says the son is a chosen cornerstone. And then he says he is a precious cornerstone. Now we move on. What else do we see happening in the text as we're trying to figure out what it's saying? Well, we next see that the Father states a fact about believers. He's already dropped two things about the Son, chosen precious. Now he turns his focus and the Father says something about believers. What does he say? He says, and the one who trusts in him, that's the believer, will never be put to shame. So we see a fact state about believers, which is the believer will not partake in shame. Does that make sense? Pretty, pretty easy to see that, isn't it? Chosen, precious, cornerstone, cool. I get those two facts. All right, uh, won't partake in shame. Yep, I see where that is. The one who trusts him will never be put to shame. But now we have something else happening. We look at that first part of verse 7. Go ahead and look at your Bibles or your apps. It says, now to you who believe the stone is precious. So what do we see happening here? Well, now we see Peter stating a fact about believers. Peter's now coming in. He's saying, I got a fact to say about you guys too. To you who believe the stone is precious. So what is he saying here? And this is our fifth blessing. He actually is saying they will partake in honor. I know that sounds kind of weird because it doesn't match. Everything else you can kind of see very clearly. If I was to tell you, pull all these things out of the text, you're like, yep, Pastor Kevin, I get, I get the first two facts that God says. I see it clearly written. You're just kind of rewording it. Very, very unique of you. Right? I see what he, God's saying about the believers. I get that. And, and oh, Peter's talking about preciousness. Uh, and uh, I don't really see this at first glance. And it's very hard to see this fifth blessing upon a cursory glance of the text. And unfortunately, that's how most of us read the word. We go from it from a very quick cursory glance. We read the translation in front of us. We go ahead and look and we say, okay, uh, now do you who believe the stone is precious? The fact about the believer is believers should find Jesus precious. Um, it's going to take us a little bit of uncovering, a little bit of work to kind of see where I'm coming from with this, but I do trust that we will do this aptly and do this well, and you'll understand, and hopefully you'll be blessed for it. But before we get there, because that's going to take us a minute, let's lay the foundation for, all the, for this fifth blessing. Let's start by looking at that first fact. Now you can actually pretend it's there, okay? Now let's look at that first fact about Jesus. The fact that the Father states that Christ is a chosen cornerstone, Okay? Before we dig into this, I want to say this. Um, our ability to partake in honor, because that's what we're talking about here, right? That fifth blessing, the ability to partake in honor. Our ability to partake in honor is contingent, my friends, upon Christ himself being honored, okay? Our ability to partake in honor is contingent upon Christ's ability to be honored, okay? Um, the honor that Christ receives, though, is completely due to his position as the chosen cornerstone. I want to say that again because I think that sets the tone for all of this. Our ability to partake in honor is contingent upon Christ himself being honored, and the honor that Jesus Christ himself receives is due to his position as the chosen cornerstone. Okay. Now, if you're like, I'm struggling to get some of these things because I don't understand what a cornerstone is. No problem. Let's kind of jump into what that is. Peter has been using building metaphors. Paul uses body metaphors, right? He talks about the, the church is a body of Christ, hands and feet. He talks about all that. They, Audio Adrenaline made some really cute song about it in the late 90s. Uh, Peter, on the other hand, desires to use building metaphors, right? He told us not too long ago that we were what? A spiritual house, building metaphor. He says that we're living stones, building metaphor. Now he says that Christ is a cornerstone, another building metaphor. Well, what is a cornerstone? Here's a good picture of one. Very hard to find pictures of cornerstones. It's very hard to kind of find uh, photos of cornerstones because nowadays they're mainly used for ceremonial purposes on buildings for dates and whatnot. We don't typically build with them, but there was a time where that was very common. And this is a good picture of what a cornerstone was. You can see it there. It is the very 
tall, the very large um, stone that everything is built off of. Let me go ahead and read to you from a architecture digest that I found, and it gives a good definition. It says, in relation to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid for a structure, with all other stones laid in reference to said cornerstone. The cornerstone marks the geographical location by orienting a building in a specific direction. Let's go back to what I started up. I said, I said, our ability to partake in honor is contingent upon Christ being honored, right? And I said, the honor that Jesus receives is due to his position as the chief chosen cornerstone, okay? Um, you got to realize the size, the shape, the planning, the measurements of a cornerstone is what makes or breaks a building, okay? Um, so any honor given to a building once it's erected is due to the cornerstone being executed flawlessly. So the honor that Christ receives, my friends, comes from his position as the perfectly planned, executed, formed, shaped, and, and set up cornerstone. All right? this, he is a cornerstone, one that laid the foundations, is laying, and will continue to lay the foundations for the kingdom of God. That's a pretty weighty building that's being built upon this cornerstone. If a building is honored because the cornerstone is done well, well, the kingdom of God finds its cornerstone in Christ. That's pretty impressive. The kingdom of God is something that should be honored, how much more so Christ, who lays the foundation for the entire thing, sets the direction for it, orients everything in that kingdom. Christ is the pivotal part of it. Um, There's a huge honor in that. See, Christ is honored because he is the chosen perfect cornerstone that all of creation was groaning for, longs for, and needs, and will continue to need. Because just as a good cornerstone holds up a building, if that cornerstone was put in right the moment you remove that, the building should collapse. My friends, the moment you remove Christ from Christianity, the kingdom of God should collapse. There is no Christianity without Christ. He must be who he says he is. He's worthy of all praise, all honor, because he upholds the kingdom. Creation himself, we're told in Scripture, is upheld by the words of his testimony. The kingdom of God should be honored. How much more so should Christ be honored? He's a perfect cornerstone, okay? I love using a cornerstone as a metaphor for Jesus. Um, If you go back to 1 Kings You can make a little note if you want to go ahead and read it. It's a really cool passage. 1 Kings chapter 6. We see God laying out exactly how Solomon's temple should be built. And bro, like, if you ever want to just read how elaborate that temple was, it is incredible. That that whole chapter just speaks very vividly of it. But what really struck me as absolutely magnificent, marvelous, and incredible is how it lays out how the building should be built. And it lays out how the cornerstone is formed. It's really cool because we see the Temple Mount in Jerusalem as the site of Solomon's temple prior to Herod's temple, which was uh, in Jesus' time. But prior to this, when Solomon was king, Solomon was David's son, there was a specific space designated for the temple. Uh, This was a holy space. And the way that God prescribed the temple to be built was he goes, not a single hammer, tool, or any sound could be heard. Because the entire temple was cut, formed, and shaped off-site. So the cornerstone was chosen, it was shaped, it was formed, and then every single other stone that would be laid in Solomon's temple was then shaped and formed off-site based on the size, shape, and, and, and uh, uh, orientation and angles cut in this cornerstone. So if that cornerstone... Once they did all of these stones, I mean hundreds and thousands and thousands of stones, once they brought all those stones to the site of the building, if that cornerstone was not brought with it and not set up exactly so, or if they said, hey man, we lost it, my bad, we could just get another one, we'll put something similar, nothing would go together. That cornerstone set all the angles. If that cornerstone was off by just a little bit, every wall would be crooked. It would have gaps. It wouldn't align right. You would not have a proper sound structure. You couldn't simply replace it with another one that was similar. I, I thought it was so magnificent, the precision that went into choosing a stone ahead of time, 
picking out a stone ahead of time. Before the temple was even built, the cornerstone was identified and chosen. And before it was even built, all the stones were already oriented to it. That's Jesus. He was chosen before time began, chosen before the foundations of history to be the cornerstone that the kingdom of God would be built upon. Every single stone, which is his church, was oriented to that cornerstone in advance. It's a beautiful metaphor for Christ that we see happening here. What honor Christ should receive for what he's done, right? Just like you can't choose another cornerstone after you've already cut and shaped every other stone off of it, you have to use that same one. Any other one that you choose to use, even if it's kind of similar, it's not going to work. It's the same thing with our lives. If Christ is not our cornerstone, our life is going to be in shambles. But see, we're dumb, and we do that anyways, amen? Like, we choose very poor cornerstones for our life, do we not? Like, y'all, before Christ, y'all did it. And now, even though you, some of you, you do have Christ, you still choose sometimes to maybe, like, maybe I could just slip this one in there, and I don't need it. Like, we choose our careers as a cornerstone. Remember, see, that one of the neat, one of the, uh, and I, I think in the etymology of, of the word cornerstone, it has to do with setting angles. Every single angle of that building, vertical and horizontal, was, was oriented off of the angle of that cornerstone. So the whole building is oriented off of that. We orient our lives off of very poor ones, like a career. We say, okay, here's my career. Here's what I'm going to do with it. Here's the trajectory of it. Here's what my boss thinks of me. Here's what my employers think of me. Here's what, my, uh, here's what the people under me are going to do. And, and here's kind of where I want to go. And here's my upward mobility. And I think I'm in a career that has room for, for, for upward growth. And I can get this. And then I can retire at this. You've made your career your cornerstone. And that's just the dumbest thing I can think of. Because it's a very poor one. And it will collapse. The building will collapse. It will not work for you. We do that also, also with relationships. And we think that's very altruistic because oh, relationship, you know, just the relationship between the husband and wife, that's the most important thing in the world. No, it's, it's not. Your relationship with Jesus is. Because if that is not right, then your relationship won't be right. And we see this with wonderstruck teens as they go, oh, he's my everything. Don't laugh because y'all adults do the same stupid thing. So you bounce from one to another to another to another. And what happens is you've chosen a poor cornerstone and it falls apart. You do with your finances. I've saved well. I got my 401k. I got this. I got this. I'll be able to retire at this. Who are you, oh man, you creature from the dirt to presume that you know what God's going to do with your life? You don't even have the ability to give yourself breath tomorrow. We choose very poor cornerstones. And then we wonder why our building looks janky and jacked up and nobody wants to hang out in it. Why is the rain dripping my head? Well, I had a really crappy cornerstone. Nothing lines up, but this is my lot. <laughs> Christ must be the cornerstone. He must be. Not only is he the chosen cornerstone, but Christ is also the precious cornerstone. Um, when I think of the word precious, I don't know what comes to your mind. <laughs> my precious like that's just i'm saying that's where i go to right like a naked little hobbit it's my precious right like i love Gollum. i think Gollum is a great example of a christian's relationship with jesus maybe that analogy doesn't work totally but like i'm just saying like he loved his little ring it was his precious so what does precious mean it means more than like looking at your granddaughter and be like oh she's precious like i I, I look at, um, at little Amberly and I'm like, oh, she's precious. And then she screams. I don't know if you ever got to hear um, my little granddaughter scream. But uh, um, Mary Jane once said, she goes, if she does not turn into an opera singer, I'm going to be pissed. Because I had to listen to those screams. They better pay off for me someday. But like, you can look at a little child and be like, oh, that's precious. But that's not really what it means, right? Precious is like this deep, deep longing in your gut for something this desire to have something and you just you care for it you hold it dearly right you jump into mount doom holding on to it and you're happy going to your death because you have it it's precious to you right so god calls jesus not just the chosen cornerstone but he calls christ the precious cornerstone um and i like this because he's not saying he's simply just a perfect cornerstone as if it's simply a fact to be affirmed, well, it's logically 
perfect, right? Because you can have the perfect cornerstone, everything is, is there, and you, you can state it objectively with no emotion. This is perfect, this is great, we value this. But it's another thing to say it's also dear to me. I also adore it. I also long for it. I also love it. And it's irreplaceable to me. You can replace it with something that is the exact same size, shape, and color, but that one was precious to me. So we see not just the cognitive knowledge that Christ is a perfect cornerstone, according to the Father, but now we get the emotional component where the Father says, I also find this one to be precious to me. I like that combination of the two. It's not irrational emotionalism. It's not dead knowledge. A lot of the Christian faith nowadays is one or the other. But it's a beautiful combination of both as he talks about his son, right? But what makes the son precious to the father? Now, all of this is setting the foundation for that fifth blessing. We need to understand why Christ is honored so well so we can understand why you partake in it. And that's why we're setting it up this way this morning, okay? Um, three, there's so many reasons, but let me give you three reasons why uh, Christ is precious to the Father based off of Scripture. First one is Jesus is precious because of his unique relationship with the Creator, right? Uh, Matthew 13, or I'm sorry, Matthew 3, 17 uh, says this, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son, and I'm well pleased with him. That's how the Father relates to the Son. It's a very unique relationship. Jesus called the beloved son. This is a precious relationship. It's not simply an ordinary factual relationship. It is very precious to the father. We also see that Christ is precious because of his unique position within creation. If you look at Ephesians 1.22, we read this. And he, this is the father, put all things under his, the son's feet, and gave to him to be the head over all things to the church. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. So we see that Christ is also precious to the Father because of Christ's unique position within creation. Jesus is above all things. He's above all things. That's not an ordinary position. That is a precious position. Jesus is also precious because of his unique role over all creation. In Hebrews 4.14, 4, we read, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heavens. See, Christ is precious because he has a very unique role over within and to creation. He is our high priest. That is not an ordinary role, my friends. That is an extraordinary, precious role, okay? He's precious, but in this there is great honor. There's great honor bestowed on Christ because of his preciousness, because of his perfectness. And before I get into that, let me just, uh, I think it is worth noting to say this. Um, Jesus is precious to the Father whether or not he is precious to the world. Jesus is precious to the Father whether or not he's even precious to the believer. Wait, wait, wait a minute, no. <laughs> How could a believer not find Christ precious? Because we did see those two sermons that we started out looking at this morning where we were told if he's not precious to you, you're probably not a Christian. I would argue that that's not biblically true. Um, I believe there are people in this congregation right now, and there are many uh, throughout history who have saving faith with Jesus Christ, but Christ is not supremely precious to you. He might be precious to you to a point, but he is not your supremely precious. You come here on a Sunday with saving faith, but Christ is not supremely precious to your heart. He is not your supreme desire. That doesn't negate your salvation, but what it does mean is that while you will experience eternity in the presence of God one day, while you'll be welcomed into the kingdom, you will be remiss because you will find out that you lived a life where you didn't get to indulge in all the wonders that come from a sold-out relationship with Jesus Christ. You will be remiss. You are living a life right now where Christ is not supremely precious to you, and because of that, you are missing out 
on life more abundantly. You are missing out on the life that God desires for you to have, a life where you have supreme joy, supreme delight, and supreme pleasure in him. You're settling for an unfulfilling relationship with Jesus Christ. I think there are people who do not find Christ supremely precious, but they are saved. But the point is, your view of Christ in relation to preciousness does not have anything to do with the fathers. The father finds him precious whether or not anyone else does. It's just like what we talked about last week. We talked about praise, right? Praise was a sacrifice. We said praise is a sacrifice because praise means we praise God not simply because things are good, but because he is good. You praise him not because you think he's worthy of praise, but because he simply is worthy of praise. The character and nature of Jesus and God, my friends, has nothing to do with how you view it. Make sense? So how does this preciousness and how does this chosen have to do with honor? Well, let me give you a little example here. You can be honored because you've done a good job at something, right? I think a lot of us, we've done, at some point in time in our life, we've done something well. I hope you have. Whether it was just drawing a horrible picture that your parents put up on a fridge. Like, okay, there you go, right? But you can be honored a lot. Of, you can be honored kind of two ways. One, you can be honored because you did a good job. I was in the military for 12 years, and um, I would, if I did something good, the NCO or the OIC, uh, they did not find me precious. <laughs> I never was called precious my time in the Marine Corps. I don't know why. I don't know why. I think the Navy guys every now and then like saw us eating crayons, and they're like, you're precious. <laughs> um, but you can, like, you can get an award, and they honor you because you did a good job. You did well. You completed a task. You were honored for doing that. We see that in your careers, right? You see that possibly in your community. You did well. You're honored for it. Christ is the chosen cornerstone. He did well. He's honored by the Father for it. Makes sense, right? But check it out. You can also be honored a different way. You can be honored because someone finds you just so dearly special to them, correct? Listen, that person is a walking disaster. They are a hot mess on a warm day. But I adore them. You ever have anybody in your life like that? If you've reproduced, you do. Right? Like, you're like, you are a funk of a mess. You try my patience. I don't think you've done a lot right this year, but my gosh, do I delight in you. You are just so dear to me. And, I, and, and sometimes we, some people get mad because they're like, well, you got a bias towards them. You ever had that happen? Like where you, where you show favoritism towards someone when clearly they are not the one that should be favored. Maybe you've had an employee and you're like, this guy is an idiot. This guy does everything right, but I just love this idiot. And you kind of honor him and you give them special stuff. And they're like, dude, what's going on? Like, I'm sorry, but they're precious to me. Right? I'm not saying that that's Jesus. The analogy doesn't hold it. But you get what I'm saying? Like, you can be honored for simply doing something good. You can be honored also because someone finds you so precious. Do you know why Christ is honored? Not simply because he did a good work. He's also honored for that and because of his preciousness to the Father. It's both. His honor is magnified because the Father delights in the Son and approves His work. It's both. So the honor that Jesus has, my friends, if you haven't figured this out by now, is magnificent. It is unparalleled. He cannot be honored anymore, and He will never be honored any less by the Father. And that happens regardless of what you or anybody else in the world thinks. You track Him with me up and down, north and south. Cool, so let's move on. And let's take a look at that first fact about the Christian. This one's pretty short, but, the five, but this sets up our, our, our punch at the end for what that blessing is. We need to get this one first. The first two facts about Jesus that we just went over, this lays the foundation for this blessing. But then this first fact about the Christian, I think this sets the stage for the blessing that's about to come on that we're going to read in verse 7. So let's go ahead and read this. Where do we see this first fact about the Christian? Well, it says, oops, did I just jump forward way too many? Look at that. Somebody didn't know what they were doing when they were making slides last night, did they? Don't look at the bottom one. 
Just don't look at it. If somebody wants to come up and tape over that, that's cool. Or just hold your hand up there. Don't let anybody see that. <laughs> the first fact about this Christian is they will not partake in shame. And we see that in the end of verse 6. And it says what? The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. This is a fact the Father says about those of us today who are in Christ. That we will not partake in shame. Now, I think we understand who, uh, if I was asked, well, who is the one who trusts in him? Well, we, we obviously say, well, Pastor Kevin, the one who trusts in him is the Christian, right? Yeah, yeah but I, I struggle with this because I think we have a really, really crappy idea of what the word trust in Jesus means nowadays. I really think we've done a poor job of of making that meaning mean something because we say things like, oh, just trust in the Lord. I, I don't know if you say it like that. But you know what I mean? Like, it's just this trust in Jesus. Or you talk to someone like, you know, do you have faith? They're like, oh, I trust in the Lord. I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, do you know what you mean when you say that? Because I think it's a very ambiguous thing, right? I trust in Jesus. Do you, Karen? I don't know, that's not right. I'm sorry if that's your name. Like, listen, 2010 on has done a horrible job to uplifting Karens and Kyles as well. Sorry, Kyle, I know we have one of you here. Drink Monster and punch holes in walls, right? But you know what I mean? Like, people say that, and I think what they're saying is, they, you know, I trust, in, I trust in Jesus. Like, they're saying something like, well, I trust that he's going to do things for me. But see, trusting, the one who trusts in him, it... it it doesn't mean simply that you trust that he's going to do something for you or you simply trust that he exists in some spiritual state or you trust that he was a historical figure, a, a first century Jewish man who had a following and, and, um, and did some things in Judea. That's not what trust in Jesus means. Trust in Jesus means you trust that he means everything that he says. In the Gospels. It means you trust he actually said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. It also means that you trust when he says, anyone who does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not hate mother and father is not worthy of me. It means you believe and trust everything he says. That if you're not in me, I'm going to throw you in the fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It means that you trust Every single thing that Jesus says about himself, about sin, about repentance, about purity, about sanctification, it means you trust that he did and will do and is doing everything he says he's going to do. It means you trust everything he says about the Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? It means that you trust that, that when he says the Father has wrath against sin, that you trust that's really true. And you trust that you really are a sinner and you are deserving of the full wrath of God and nothing you can do can save yourself except for clinging to Christ and receiving the propitiation and the redemption through the cross. So when, when he says those who trust in him, I, I gotta be very clear, man. It doesn't mean what I think some of y'all say it means. This little mamby-pamby uh, ambiguous idea that you just trust that there's this God and that, well, yeah, it's Jesus and the Bible's kind of real. Like, it, it's legit faith, bro. You get what I'm saying? All right. So he's saying that we'll never be put to shame. All right. Well, I get, I, I kind of, I want to understand that better because that seems like an important thing to know about. I don't like shame. I don't want to be put to shame. He says they will be never put to shame. I think to understand the full way that we have to understand who will be put to shame and why certain people will be. Let me give you an illustration of what it means to be put to shame because I think that's a weird, a weird term. I don't use that a lot. But let's say there's this dude who lives here in Jefferson, okay? And this individual gets a hot stock tip. Well, I don't know if people in Jefferson invest in stocks. <laughs> I don't know how accurate that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's say there's this individual and he has an investment opportunity. He's like, this is going to work, right? 
So homeboy goes out, and he takes out his life savings, and he puts it all in this investment. He's like, oh, no, no, I need more because this is, gonna, this is, this is a sure thing. So he pulls out a second mortgage on his home. Fun fact, just, just don't do that. That's a bad idea. So he gets the second mortgage on his home, and he puts it in this investment. He goes, no, nah, I got to get more. So he, he, he borrows against his 401. He borrows against his credit cards, and he puts it all in. He's like, dude, I need more. So he goes to friends and family, and he's like, listen, this is a sure thing. He's posting about it on Facebook. He's bright. He's like, I got this. This is beautiful. And he's got some friends and family like, all right, man, we trust you. You say it's going to happen. Here's some money. So he borrows from friends and family. Then he's so sure of it, he goes into work. And what does he do? He's like, I'm out. Kiss my butt. I'm about to be rich. And he quits his job publicly. And he's bragging about it. He's like, y'all are suckers. I'm out. I mean, living the high life. I don't need to come back here. Like, he is confident, right? And then a couple days later, it turns out to be a complete flop. This guy loses everything. And doesn't just lose everything privately, right? Homeboy loses it publicly. All of his posts on social media, his public quitting, friends and family. He's just publicly put to shame. We would say that man was put to shame, right? Not just embarrassed, but there's a shame on him. And that shame almost goes into the family, doesn't it? Like if you're the family, you kind of feel shame. That's, that was my dad. That was my husband. There's this shame that comes down. Because someone truly trusted in something that in hindsight was absolutely foolish and stupid. And now they have this shame over them. That's the type of weighty shame, even more weighty. Of uh, that, that the unbeliever will experience the day they find out that they trusted in things that hindsight is showing is foolish. And they will not be shamed simply privately, but they will be shamed publicly as they will be put to shame in front of all of creation for all of eternity as God condemns them for their foolish choices. They trusted not simply in something like this man. Let's go back to our example. You know, the, the bright side of this dude is he can move to another city, right? Changes change his last name, you know, move out, go somewhere else. He can kind of escape that shame, but there's no escaping the shame that goes for eternity when it comes from God. You get what I'm saying? Like, that is a weighty shame, man. And can you imagine just, just the, the sheer force of that when you realize, like, dude, I trusted in karma my whole life. What, what, what goes around will come around. If I put good out in the universe, then good vibes and positive energy will come back to me. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you stand before God, you're like, oh, there is a God, and there is a wrath, and there is justice, and there is righteousness. And I trusted my, not just my finances like this man, but I trusted my entire life and my eternity into something foolish. You imagine how that has to feel? That's the weight of shame that those who reject Christ, and if that's you this morning, I, I'm, I'm not trying to scare you, but I am trying to warn you that there's a cliff coming and you're about to fall off it. And I, and I say that out of love because I actually care about you. Peter's saying, man, this is, this is the shame that the Christian who truly trusts in Christ will escape. And this sets the stage for what we come to next, which is the Christian has the ability to partake in honor. And that's the second fact about the Christian. Peter's the one that lays this out, okay? Let's take a look at that. That's, that comes from verse 7. Now, you go ahead and you read verse 7. And we read this morning. And this is where we, we kind of get a little hairy because it doesn't seem to jive, right? We read this verse 7, the beginning of it. It says, now to you who believe, this stone is precious. And we read beautiful sermons from hundreds of years ago by, by Spurgeon. I mean, it's gorgeous and emotional and faithful. It's good. It's truthful. We, we go back and we listen to... Piper preached in 82 and towards the beginning of his ministry as he talked about this same verse and how the Christian is called to find Christ precious. It's beautiful. It's emotional. And that is true. And you say, how can this verse that says, now to you who believe the stone is precious, how does that mean the Christian will partake in honor? Or in this case, we have the blessing, which is the ability to partake in honor. How do we get that from that particular text? Well, if we go back to the Greek, um, it's a fun word. The word precious 
in Greek is Timé. Probably not pronounced just like that, but I like saying it that way. Timé. Timé. Uh, it's just fun saying it that way. Greek's fun. All right. But um, <laughs> so Timé is this Greek word, and it's used 45 times in the New Testament. You're like, all right, cool. 45 times it's used. All I got to do is look at all 45 times and see how it was translated and in the context, and I'll help understand it, right? Well, if you take a look at it, you can do this a lot simpler with a concordance. You'll find that 35 of those times, yo, 35 out of those 45, it was translated as honor. The other nine times, a variation of honor. One time it was translated as precious here. Just once here. It's primarily a word that's used in the New Testament and in other ancient Greek writings as honor. That's the primary way it's used. Now, if you get a literal reading of the Greek, and literal readings of Greek is really fun because they make no sense, and it sounds like you're trying to convert Spanish to English without actually moving things around, and it reads very funny. Um, but here's a literal reading of, of verse 7. If you go word for word from the Greek, it says this. Rather, unto you, therefore, which believe is the honor? In front of us, in the NIV, or, the, or your, your, your scripture in front of you, it says, Now to you who believe the stone is precious. But the actual Greek says, Rather, unto you, therefore, which believe is the honor? It has nothing to do with stones. It has nothing to do with preciousness. Now, you might be able to infer preciousness from this. You could infer it. But it's not the best translation, my friend. Um, that doesn't fit the context. The problem is um, the King James that translated as precious. Uh, well, the King James translation was working from very poor Greek manuscripts. And since then, we've found more and more accurate ones. And our, our understanding of ancient Greek has gotten better. And we've realized that a lot of the, 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 the scripture in the King James is just really poorly translated. And then the NIV comes around and they did an okay job getting into more readable English. But they're working off of some of the same things. So we, we have two of the most popular translations of the Bible, translating it that the stone should be precious to you, but the actual better interpretation is, therefore unto you who believe is the honor. And that works better, my friends, because it, it fits with what Peter was doing in verse 6. See, what Peter was doing was really cool. This is genius, and it wasn't Peter being genius. This is the Holy Spirit through him. But he's showing, hey, listen, all right, Christians, here's the deal, man. You get to escape shame. And, and what happens is he takes away that, that bad thing, the shame. He goes, you get to escape it. But now we got this negative space here. And now what he does is he fills it by saying, you're going to partake in honor. Right? He takes away the shame. He goes, you don't have to experience shame. And then immediately in verse 7, but to you who believe there is honor. You replace the shame with honor. That makes more sense. That's the proper reading of it. And when we read it that way, we go, oh, cool, I see what you're doing, Peter. You're trying to show me that I don't have to suffer shame because of my faith, but instead I get to have honor for my faith. If you have an ESV Bible or a CSB or um, an NASB, they've actually translated very accurately um, with the word honor. But I like this. He's providing us a sharp contrast. We get to partake in honor. Unto you, which believe, is the honor. See, Peter's not making a statement about what Christ is. He is precious. He's not stating that. Isaiah already did that. He already quoted that. The Father already said he's precious. We know that. Peter's not simply repeating that statement in the beginning of verse 6. He's saying something totally different. He's saying that honor, not shame, is what the believer partakes in collectively upon that last day. And that's, guys, my friends, this is very cool because as I stated earlier, when it talks about partaking in shame, the day comes where all of those who rejected Christ will partake in the same collective shame. Understand, it's not an individual shame that God goes, you are going to have shame for this. You're going to, it's all of these who have rejected Christ. There is a condemnation and a collective shame that they all partake in as rejecting Jesus. In the same sense, there is all the saints throughout history 
from Peter all the way to your great, 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 great grandkids whenever Jesus comes back. And we all as saints collectively participate in the same honor. Collective shame, collective honor. Unbelief, belief. Not trusting, trusting. False cornerstones, chosen, precious cornerstone. Collective honor given to the believer. And let's go back to that first fact about Jesus. I said that he is a cornerstone. And when I Mentioned that, I, I, I said this a few times, I've said it about four times today. Our ability to partake in honor is contingent upon Christ being honored. Then I said the honor that Jesus receives is due to his position as the chosen cornerstone. Let me give you a little bit of, uh, make this a little easier to understand. If you have a poor cornerstone, you have a crappy building. If you have a crappy building, then the architect is shamed, yes? If the architect is shamed, then his whole team experiences the same collective shame with him, right? Imagine the architect gets to build a building for the king. He gets a contract. He makes a bid on it. They say, all right, you get to build the building for the king. And he, he chooses a really crappy cornerstone. <laughs> and the angles are all wonky. And this thing ends up terrible, and there's cracks and gaps, and the king looks at it, he goes, tear that thing down, that guy is horrific. And everyone in the whole land was watching this man build, and they were, oh, this is the man, he's going to build this. And then they watch the king destroy it, and the shame comes upon him. Poor cornerstone, crappy building. The crappy building, the architect is shamed. And as the architect is shamed, his whole team hangs their head low, because they experience that same collective shame, because they cast their lots in with him. Well, the converse is you have a good cornerstone, a perfect one, a chosen one, a precious one. And when that happens, you get a beautiful, good building. And when the building is good, the architect is honored. And when the architect is honored, his whole team lifts their head high, and they partake in that same honor along with him. They hold their head up high, and they walk, knowing that they get to receive the same honor that the man who did the work gets to receive. And they walk in the, in the sweet joy of saying, we were on that team. We get to participate in the honor due to him. My friends, if you are team Jesus this morning, if you have laid your life upon the chosen cornerstone, you will be honored because Jesus himself will be honored because the entire kingdom rests upon him and he is perfectly oriented to himself. It's a beautiful experience that we get to have as believers. We did nothing to deserve it. He did everything. He laid the stone. He shaped us in advance. As we laid down on top as living stones, oriented to the chief cornerstone, the building is built and it's beautiful and the kingdom of God prevails. Christ is glorified. He is honored. And those who are team Jesus get to participate in that same honor. This is an awesome, awesome, encouraging word for suffering believers. And that's who Peter's writing to. If you're saying, Pastor Kevin, this whole book in First Peter, you might recall, you're saying, hey, I, you, you've been telling us this is a book written to suffering believers. And if you didn't know that, this is. This is a letter that uh, Peter, the guy who hung out with Jesus, called The Rock. He's writing this letter to some people who are suffering big time. And everything and every page is supposed to encourage them deeply. You say, how is this an encouragement when you're suffering? Because you might be saying, hey, I get it, honor, this is a great thing, like, hey, yay. But how is that specifically encouraging when you're suffering? Well, remember, these are believers that have been removed from their homes. They've been scattered all about throughout the Roman Empire. They're suffering at the hands of an unjust ruler, Nero, in 62 AD when Peter wrote this letter. They're experiencing horrific persecution, not just physically, but socially, politically. They're losing careers. They're being arrested. Some are being murdered. What do you think they're feeling right now? Well, I'll tell you what they're feeling. They're feeling that they're partaking in Christ's suffering. They are people who are partaking in Christ's persecution. They are people who are partaking in Christ's hatred. All of the things that Jesus experienced, they are partaking in right now. And it sucks. And you know what sucks even more is as they're partaking in the persecution that was 
given to Christ, the hatred that was given to Christ, the suffering that was given to Christ, as they have found themselves partaking in all of these things, they turn and they look at their persecutors. And their persecutors are partaking in levity. Their, their persecutors are partaking in prosperity. Their persecutors are partaking in freedom and physical blessings. These guys need to be encouraged that the faith that is bringing them earthly shame is one day going to bring them heavenly honor. They need to know that. We are experiencing this shame that you talked about, Peter, in verse 6, but we're experiencing it here on earth. That's great we don't have to experience it for eternity, but right now we are partaking in shame by people who are partaking in blessings, and they're wicked and ungodly. And Peter writes this to say, hang in there, man. Hang in there, beloved. Keep going. Run the race. Don't stop. Honor is coming. Shame is your lot, but honor is coming. Beloved, hang in there. It's not going to last. He's telling them, those who are putting you to shame will someday themselves be put to shame. And as they are put to shame, brother and sister in Christ, they will see you partaking in honor at the very one who is condemning them. Hang in there. Don't quit. Keep enduring. That's what he's saying. And my friends, when you are suffering and watching others prosper, you are, partake, you are partaking in the worst that Christ endured while others are, partake, are partaking in the best the earth has. You need someone to tell you this because this message is joy. This is sweet encouragement. My friends, that reminder, that's the remedy for earthly suffering. You know, uh, maybe you're here today and uh, you're weary, Right? Maybe you're tired because for a while now, uh, your faith has been a source of trouble for you, maybe with your family, uh, with your friends, your career. Maybe you're suffering because for a long time now, you have been choosing the very hard, godly path in every situation. You are making hard decisions to please God, and you are encountering suffering and persecution and hardships along the way, and there has been no reward for your effort, and you are weary, you are frustrated, maybe you're a little angry. Let me make this very clear. Your faith will never put you to shame, okay? Um, brother and sister Christian, hear me. Uh, the day is coming. <laughs> um, the day is coming, and it is coming soon. And when that day comes, your faith is going to bring you great honor before God. Your faith is going to give you great honor before all of creation. Uh, not because you're great, not because you did an honorable thing, quite the contrary, but because the stone that the rest of the world rejected is the chief cornerstone, the stone your life has been laid upon is the only one that is true, and it's true because that stone was chosen for this very purpose, the redemption of all mankind. The stone that the kingdom of God we built upon. And the day is coming where your choice to align with that stone is going to bring you great honor because that stone is honored and that stone is Jesus. Some of you are suffering and I want you to understand that your days of being shamed are numbered. Some of you need to hear that. Your days of experiencing shame are numbered. And the day is coming, and it is coming soon, where you will get to revel in the honor that comes from the Father to the Son. You will get to participate in that joyous celebration. You will get to receive the honor that is due the Son. And your days of suffering will be over. So if that's you, then I would tell you, please, as Peter pled with these Christians who read this letter, I plead with you this morning, please take heart. Um, do not give up. Fight a little bit longer. Endure well and suffer as only the Christian can suffer because only the Christian has a hope of eternal honor through Jesus Christ. Let me close this in prayer. 
Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to read your word. I thank you that you have given us eyes to be able to see the truth in it. Lord, um, we are depraved, we are blind, and we are rebellious. And if not for your grace, we would stay blind, deaf, and dumb. I thank you that you love us enough not to keep us in that condition, but that you've opened our hearts and our eyes to be able to see the truth in your word. Father, I would ask that you would help us to take great encouragement in what it said today. That because your son was chosen, because he is precious, he has great honor. And because we get to align ourselves with him, we too can receive great honor. I thank you that the days of experiencing shame here on earth are numbered for all of us. Lord, I am weary and I am exhausted from some of the shame that I've experienced at my own hand and some unjustly. And I long, I long for the day that you call me home. I desire deeply to be with you. I want to experience honor. I am tired of experiencing shame. I want to experience a sweet encouragement that only you give. I am tired. I am weary. And I thank you that you've given us books like, like this where we can read that we're not alone in that. That there is a whole mess of Christians that experience the same thing, but your words to them were not to quit and give up, but were to press on and to remember that hope is coming. Suffering will be over. Joy will be at our, at our fingertips. So as we hear that, we say, Lord Jesus, come and come quick. But until then, let us be faithful. Let us endure well. Let us suffer well, not just for our own edification, but so that lost people could see the hope that we have and it would cause them to long for the same thing and experience the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the faithfulness of this church. Father, convict hearts that do not know you this morning and draw them sweetly into your presence. And for those of us who do know you, may we just find so much encouragement today. May we find joy today in your word. May we delight in your word. We want to have supreme satisfaction in you. And I thank you so much. And you freely give that in Christ's name.